The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. It all starts now. Welcome to Time of Grace. I'm Pastor John Enter. I'm so glad you are here with us today. The message that Pastor Mark is going to share with you is one that we all need to hear. We all battle with guilt. We all battle with things inside of our lives. We go, man, I'm not good enough. I don't measure up. How could God love me? How could God forgive me when I'm a collaborator, where I'm someone who matches up with evil, walks with evil, even though I've promised God and promised myself, I'm never going to do that again. And the guilt sets in. And we wonder, could God really love me? Will God really forgive me? Pastor Mark is closing up his sermon series this week on what is Jesus doing here? And he's going to explore the topic of why Jesus overall came to save you. To save you from your sins, to save you from your guilt, to save you from every wrong that you have ever done in your life. So that inside of yourself, you can have peace, which so often is lacking. You can have joy in the midst of all the darkness of this world because the one thing you hold on to is the power of God and the truth of what Jesus gives, that he came to save you. Now, we're going to join Jesus and his disciples on Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem. You might call it his death journey. As they get close to Jerusalem, Jesus now is going to get really serious with his disciples, and a bunch of very important things are taking place. Would you like to open up your Bible with me to Luke chapter 18? And we're going to look at just a couple verses at the end of chapter 18, and then we're going to dig into our main story in chapter 19. Jesus in verse 31 of chapter 18, Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that's written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. His meaning was hidden from them. They didn't know what he was talking about. What? Did Jesus' words sound that puzzling to you? You're going to say, well, duh. That's what, that's what he came to do, right? It's obvious to you now. If you'd been uh, talking and uh, walking with the Twelve, uh, you would have been baffled too because their idea of Messiah was so different. They wanted to see a triumphant king. They did not want to see a humble rabbi take abuse and finally die. They couldn't grasp it. They didn't see that he was the focal point of the entire Old Testament sacrificial system. The whole thing was like a great big diamond on a tiny point and it all pivoted on Jesus. The whole system pivoted on one tiny little point and that point is Jesus. So the whole world is basically like twisting in the wind right now waiting to see what's going to happen. They couldn't grasp it, and Jesus didn't argue with them. He was going to have to wait till later until the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost. They just weren't going to get it. So he just let it be, knowing that the Spirit would help them remember these words later. In fact, on the way to Emmaus, remember, he said, didn't I tell you, didn't the Scriptures say that the Christ would have to suffer and die? They knew. They just couldn't put the pieces together. It was all a big jumble in their head. So they just, if Jesus said, do you get what I'm telling you, they do what every kid says when suddenly put on the spot by a grown-up or a teacher. When you're suddenly put on the spot, what does every kid say? I don't know. Just punt. You have no idea what's going on. I don't know. That, and I, I, I sound like I'm making fun of them. I'm making fun of myself because I'd have been right there with them in their ignorance. And I can talk smart now because I've got the advantage of, first of all, the Holy Spirit having worked faith in my heart and I've got years of practice and reading these stories. This was all brand new to them. So they're real troubled. What, what is this death talk? Ooh, does this sound creepy and bad? So Jesus is now, they're climbing out of the bowl, they're climbing out of that deep, deep hole, heading up. 
They're still below sea level. Jericho is 800 feet below sea level. You think New Orleans is low. Jericho's in the bowl. It's in the hole, 800 feet below sea level. He's approaching Jericho. They see a blind man. His name is Bartimaeus. And Jesus says, well, what do you want? Duh, I'd like to see. Jesus said, oh, why don't you say so? Okay, receive your sight. And the crowd erupted. He received his sight, followed Jesus, praising God. All the people saw it. They're praising God. And the crowd explodes, and the news of that goes ahead. People ran ahead into town, and the whole town of Jericho, the oasis, the city of Palms, right on the highway to Jerusalem, is suddenly aflame with anticipation that this strange, wondrous miracle worker, this agent of God, this healer, this wonder worker is here. And Jesus is walking through town real slowly, you know, waving, smiling, talking to people. And he makes a beeline for a certain place. And here's, here's the, uh, the honey that this bee was chasing. His name was Zacchaeus. He was a collaborator. Zacchaeus had plenty of money. He was wealthy because he was a chief tax collector. So he was the first layer after the Romans. He probably had, he probably sold tax franchises to the next gen of little people around. He probably didn't, he was so high up in the organization, he didn't have to shake anybody down for money. Other people did that for him. He ran the system in Jericho. I'll tell you what, he was wealthy, but he was also lonely. People hated him. They treated him like he was a leper. And he, he said, well, that's the price of money, I guess. So he counted his money to feel better. Of course, people, we need people more than we need money. So he was not a happy man. He also knew that he had sold his soul and that he had betrayed the Israelite people to the Romans and was participating in the exploitation of the Jews and he did it anyway. Why? Because he loved money. And second, he frankly had decided he didn't care that much about the stupid suckers that he was fleecing. He just did it to make himself bigger. But it was a pretty lonely place. His only friends were his fellow collaborators. But he heard the stories of Jesus and something itched in his inside. Something made him so unhappy with his life. He said, I have to get a look at this man. Something creepy, something about him is messing with my insides. He was wealthy, but uh, his wealth couldn't buy him any more height. He was a runty little guy. And like every person who has struggled with being short, when there's a parade, you're either in the front row or you can't see a darn thing. And he said, I've got to get a look at this person. And he climbed up in a sycamore fig tree. Sycamore figs, man. That was uh, the prophet Amos's job before God ordained him into the prophet ministry. Amos was a sycamore fig tender. In fact, if you go to Israel today, there is a huge ancient sycamore fig tree that on the tourist trail, the tour guides will tell you that was Zacchaeus' tree. And you can believe that if you want or not believe it as you please. Nobody can prove it. But it's great fun. At least you get to see what a sycamore fig tree looks like. They're really big. And it would be big enough to hold a man's weight. So he climbs up in the tree and Jesus makes a beeline for him. He goes right to him and he looks up he says, yo, Zacchaeus. The guy's thinking, how does he know my name? Very scary. Is he reading, is he a mind reader too? He must, he must have insight from God. Then he shocks him again. Zacchaeus was not wearing his tax name tag. When he appeared on the street, he would kind of go, try to go incognito. He wasn't going around, you know, with a big sign, like a big t-shirt on his back saying, Zacchaeus Tax Services. People hated him so he would try to not be noticed. He wasn't wearing a name tag. Somehow Jesus knew his name. Come down immediately right now. I must stay at your house today. And he came down and welcomed him gladly. Probably nobody would step inside his house but his fellow, occup uh, his fellow betrayers and collaborators of the occupiers. 
Wow. They were the lowest of the low in Jewish society. They're generally ranked on the same level as prostitutes, people who sell their soul and their integrity and their body just for the money. They make excuses about my family needing it, got to take care of my kids, got to survive. There's all kinds of ways to self-justify, but basically there's scorn with that. And these were socially low people. All his money did not buy him an ounce of respect from the Jewish people. They hated him. And look at the reaction. When Jesus goes into this man's house, look what everybody starts saying. The people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Look at verse 7, if you have a Bible handy. The people saw this. How many of the people? What's the first word in verse 7? All All the people. Jesus got nothing but scorn himself for getting close to a weasel like Zacchaeus, a loser, a betrayer, a collaborator. He touches him. He goes into his house. He's going to eat his food and hang out with his eh, tax-collecting friends. Eh, Unclean. He's a sinner. Of course he was. He had betrayed his own people and he was stealing from people. He was a cheater. And Jesus had time for him because he knew that today there was an opening in his heart and Jesus wanted to step right in. That's why he said, hurry, because that window might have closed. That's why he said, we're doing it today, because he might not have had a chance tomorrow. And while Zacchaeus was listening, everything changed in his life. He began to perceive that there was forgiveness of his many sins brokered through Jesus and the relief he felt as the weight of his unworthiness was lifted made him want to jump for joy and made this runty short little guy feel like he was 6'4". Second, instead of despising the people around him, he suddenly was awash in shame at the cheating he'd been doing and said, I got to do things differently. Things have got to change. So grateful was he for being forgiven, what a loser he was, so grateful that Jesus paid attention to a dope like him and gave him a feeling there's a second act in Christianity. There's hope for me changed everything. He realized what an idol money had become for him, that he was a slave to his money love. It was not even love anymore. It was just lust. It was money lust. It was something he was worshiping. And it dawned on him what an idiot he had been. And so all of a sudden, now this doesn't usually happen all this fast. Usually God, I like to think of God as being like a slow cooker, you know, like a Nesco where you put some food in and then you let it cook for hours and hours and hours. This wasn't like flash fried or something you dip into hot fat and then you pull it out 30 seconds later and that that thing is crispy and crunchy and sizzly and ready to eat. This is... The way God usually does things, like on me, God, God doesn't, has not ever done any two real sudden things. My, my life has been a history of slow cooking where it dawns on me like after many years. Uh, that's how God works his changes. But this is one of those sudden things where this guy's brain blew inside out all of a sudden on one afternoon. And he comes busting out of his house and he says, says to the Lord, meaning to Jesus, look, Lord, Uh, And he calls him, not just sir, but he calls him Lord. He uses the word kurios. You know, like when we say kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. He said, he called Jesus kyrie. You are my Lord. There's hope. You have, as my Savior, you have given me hope. Here and now, two things are going to change. First, I realize I've become addicted to money and I got to get rid of half of it so I don't become its slave any longer and I'm going to give it to people who are suffering and struggling right now. I've been pampering myself. It's time for me to become generous. Second, I have been cheating people. If I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll I'll pay back four to one. If, ha, of course he had. And then Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. I love you too, Zacchaeus. You have worth to me. And I am not as interested in your past as I am interested in your future. And that moment of transformation is a powerful sign of the power of the gospel. 
Jesus then said, and here's the triumphant concluding verse, the Son of Man, meaning himself, that's his favorite term for himself, has come to seek and to save what was lost. Zacchaeus, you were lost, but today I think I found you and I think you found your Savior. What's Jesus doing here? He came to teach us. He came to heal us and make our lives better and reveal the kindness of God in contrast to the cruelty and abuse and lies of Satan. But ultimately, his greatest mission of all was to come to save us. And he came in order to give his life, as he told his disciples, to spend his life and bleed out as the fulfillment of the sacrifices that the world needs. You and I can put ourselves in this story and reenact this story. Like Zacchaeus, we can see our own need and realize without Jesus how empty and pointless our lives really would be. How many idols we chase and get addicted to. The things that we think are important are not all that important. To change our pivot and put Jesus in the middle. And to have strength for that and the desire for that because the guilt of our horrible past have been lifted. All the dumb things you've said, all the selfish things you've done, the people you've hurt, the lies you've told, the chiseling and cheating you have done to try to push yourself forward, stepping on other people to do it. All of your acts of selfishness and all the hurt you've done is all washed away in the blood of Jesus. And the same mercy that Jesus showed this runty little chiseler and cheat, he shows to you and to me as well. He came to seek you. You didn't climb up the ladder and found God. He came down the ladder from heaven to find you where you're at, the mess you are, and loved you first. And his unconditional love is not only what washes away the guilt of your sin and takes that terrible fear and guilt off of you, but it also puts joy where there had been loneliness and fear. And this releases in us gratitude to God and a reframing of our lives. Today is a great day like Zacchaeus to get rid of whatever idols you are chasing. Whatever it is that is a false God that you chase or that you value and to reorient yourself and call the Lord Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy on me. And once again put Jesus on the throne as the central part of your life. Not something on the periphery uh, like he's just an ATM machine that you ignore him until you really need something. Then you go over and like you punch the buttons and kick it a little bit hoping it, he'll cough out some money or help for you just, and then ignore him again until you run out of money again. No, the central part of your life. And I'm going to treat people with dignity and worth, all of us, need daily encouragement to do that because we're all selfish buggers at heart. You know we are. I sure am and you are too. Just be honest with me. Don't look at me cross-eyed like that. You know you are too. And Zacchaeus shows us the appropriate response to people whose hearts have been thawed by the gospel. To look at the people around us with love, dignity, compassion and treating them right and acting as Jesus did, acting like a servant. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. The Son of Man came to seek you and to save you lost people. And finally, to use you as his agents. Jesus doesn't walk the streets of Jericho any longer, but you do. And you and I get to represent him in his seeking. And if we took a list of all the people in your life who are Zacchaeus's, who are chasing other things and building a life without God in it, if we put our lists all together, we'd have thousands of names. We're hip deep in them. You and I can be Jesus' feet and hands and voice to go after people and say, you know what, God loves you unconditionally. Don't make them jump through hoops and then God will like you. Just show God's mercy first. And if they laugh you off or blow it off or whatever, not your problem. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just passing on uh, the treasure that I was given for free and I'm just giving it to you to give you a shot. God loves you and forgives you. And the sweetest joy in your life is to welcome his grace and allow your sins, guilt to be lifted off of you and to put him in the middle of your life. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save them also, the ones who are lost. And in this way, the miracle of Zacchaeus 
will continue to happen. I leave you today with just one little story. One of the most amazing days of my life was following up on a Zacchaeus lead from a friend who said, could you visit my friend Jim in the hospital? 72 years old, he had a heart episode, his life was fading. So I went to see him. He hadn't been in church in in, uh, 50 years. I baptized him in his hospital bed as he's gasping for breath. He died four days later. Let's keep our eyes open for the Zacchaeuses in our life. Yes, if you agree with me and you're willing, then say amen. Pastor of Mark's message, he just got done telling you about a blessing that God gave to him to baptize a man 72 years old on his deathbed. And when Mark was telling that story, I immediately thought of a man I got blessed to know by the name of Russell. So I'm sitting in my office one day just working on my task list that's there, thinking this is what I'm going to do with my day. No, God had other plans. And my phone rings. And the man on the other end of the line says, Hey, Pastor John, you don't know me, and you don't know my dad, but my dad is in hospice care right now. He's got days, maybe weeks to live. He's angry. Always been angry against God. Never had time for the Lord, but I want him to be with me in heaven. Can you witness to him? Can you go talk to him? So, of course, I agree, and I hang up the phone. I go, what did I just agree to do? I mean, this isn't how this works. You don't wave the Bible over the top of someone and all of a sudden they come to faith. So on my drive over to hospice care, I am locked in prayer and I'm praying, Lord God, help me. Holy Spirit, come. Anoint my words. Bless this. And I had this pit in my stomach and I'm like, come on, you're a pastor. You should know what to do in this case. And I resolved to what God said in his holy word to the Corinthian church through the pen of Paul. Paul wrote to them and said, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ. So I walked in that room of Russell expecting to be kicked out in the first five minutes or even 15 seconds of being there. And instead the Holy Spirit was already present. And I simply shared Jesus. The same thing that you can do every single day to anyone who was around to tell your story of grace I simply told Russell about God's working in my heart and in my life. I opened up scripture, simple scripture that you tell to a a 10-year-old and told him about God's love for him. And the Holy Spirit allowed me to have a front row seat to see this man who was so angry and so against God's word for so long crumble down and feel God's presence, God's grace pour back into his life. Why did Jesus come? He came to save us. One of the last things that Russell said before he passed on to glory, and one day you'll be able to meet him there, is Russell talked to his son and said, son, we got to get this word out. we got to have more people know about the peace that I now know about Christ. We need more people to share the story of Jesus. Friends, be that answer to Russell's prayer. Answer the calling that God has given to you to share so simply and so beautifully the love of Christ, his forgiveness poured down from the cross that washes away every sin of every person of all time. Be that answer. Be the one who shares Jesus. And I'll be back to pray with you soon. A group of generous donors has stepped forward with a $50,000 grant and are challenging friends like you to meet it by May 31st. That means your gift this month is worth twice as much to bring God's message of grace to more people around the world. 
through digital outreaches like Your Time of Grace videos, the Time of Grace mobile app, our partnership with the YouVersion Bible app, and our social media outreach. When you give to help meet this challenge grant by May 31st, we'll say thanks by sending you Pastor Jeske's new book, Grace for Every Race, to help you overcome any racial divides in your life or church and build a stronger community of faith. Request your copy when you give to help match the challenge grant. Call 800-661-3311, text TIME to 31313, or visit timeofgrace.org forward slash store. Thank you so much for joining us to hear this message from Pastor Mark on how Jesus saves your soul. He is always the answer, and that is why he came. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, thank you for your incredible love. Thank you for coming down here among us on this earth, for wrapping your powerful, glorious, almighty body in the weakness of human flesh. And Lord Jesus, with you now being here among us, you were tempted tempted in every single way as we are. Yet, Jesus, you were without sin. Everything we struggle with, you took head on. You went one-on-one against the devil in your incredibly weakened state. And yet, Lord Jesus, you stayed pure, you stayed holy, and you stayed righteous. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us that incredible gift, something we could never earn on our own. We need you. We need you, God, because when we face temptation, we fail and we flop. We we fall into past sins. We fall into new sins. But Lord God, we know because of your love, we can come to you. Come to you and open our hearts before you. Be transparent and to be honest. And not to come to you in fear, but come to you in faith. To come to you knowing that you love us. That if you'd be willing to send Jesus to save us, You're willing to heal us from every wrong, every error that we've ever done in our lives. Lord, as people who are praying with me right now, who've got some horrible guilt crushing down upon them, making them feel like there is no way that a God who is so powerful and so gracious could ever love them, wash that from them, Jesus. Help them to know that you do love them, that you have saved them and that you favor them so much by your incredible grace that they will one day be with you in glory. God, give us peace. Peace in your amazing grace and help us to live for you. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor John Enter. Thank you so much for joining us. It all starts now. It all starts now. Starts now. The time of grace. It all starts now. The preceding program was brought to you by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.